program uh, The Sky This Month. Uh, I'm here in the uh, uh, one of the observatories at Chabot. This is uh, our 20 inch refracting telescope that you see behind me here. If I can kind of tilt this up so you can take a look at it. That's one of our big telescopes here at Chabot. Now, uh, in pre-pandemic days, we would open the telescopes up for the public every Friday and Saturday night. You could come up and view through the telescopes. Unfortunately, right now, uh, because of the pandemic, we have to keep the telescopes closed. But Chabot is still in operation, and we are still uh, planning for our reopening uh, next year. Uh, so in the meantime, we're going to continue to do our virtual programming like tonight. Now, we have a guest tonight. Uh, Azazena Racia is an East Oakland uh, native and a bilingual journalist reporting in both Spanish and English. Azazena is a reporter with Oakland Side, uh, which is an online news magazine. She is a longtime reporter on Oakland arts, culture, and community. As an independent journalist, she also reported for KQED Arts, The Bold Italic, Zora, uh, the San Francisco Chronicle, and she was also a writer and social media editor for the East Bay Express, uh, helping readers navigate Oakland's rich artistic and creative landscapes through a wide ra range of innovative digital approaches. So, Azazena, welcome. Good evening. Hi, Gerald. Thank you so much for hosting and having the Oakland site. Uh, here tonight, I'm excited to be representing for the newsroom. And just for people watching and those who are not familiar, the Oakland newsroom is, the Oakland side is a new Oakland newsroom. We're a nonprofit uh, newsroom and we cover everything and anything in Oakland. Um, I'm the reporter for arts, arts, culture, and community. We have an education reporter. We have, uh, if you're interested in city politics, we cover that as well. Uh, and right now, of course, because people are filling out their ballots, um, a very important day coming up, uh, we have a whole section uh, with everything and anything that uh, voters need to know about voting um, in, in Oakland. So yeah, I'm excited to, to chat with you tonight. Uh, and I have some really good questions from Oakland Side good. Readers. Yeah, I'm excited. You, you wrote an article about Chabot here a couple of weeks ago and I understand that you invited your readers to submit questions. I did, I did, yeah. In fact, if those who are watching, uh, they haven't um, come across that, that story yet, it's it's on our site, oaklandside.org. And yes, so after writing the story about, you know, how the center is spending the pandemic, about the reopening and the outstanding online programming that you guys um, have, yeah, I, I invited readers. Hey, we're gonna be teaming up with Chabot Space and Science Center, send us your questions. We want to know what should Ger Gerald uh, answer this month. So I have some really good ones for you. <laughs> you know, it's going to be stump the stars tonight, huh? Yep. <laughs> okay, well, we'll get to that in a little bit. But first, tonight is our uh, monthly uh, Sky This Month program. And to help us out with that, we're going to show a little video here. This video was uh, produced and narrated by Don Saito. Don is a longtime volunteer here at the Chabot Space and Science Center. He's an amateur astronomer. He's very knowledgeable about all this, and he likes making these videos. So uh, if you, uh, you want to bear with me for a second, I'm not the most computer savvy guy in the world, so I'll try to do this right. Uh, and we'll see if we can't uh, get this to work. And I think we got it. Hey there, everybody. Just because current conditions are such that we can't meet inside our amazing Zeiss Planetarium at the Chabot Space and Science Center, doesn't mean we can't go outside and look up at the real sky ourselves. This short presentation will help guide you to find several bright stars, constellations, and planets in the month of October. Since September 22nd, we have officially moved into the fall equinox season of constellations, which can now begin to be seen at around 8 p.m., and it's these I'll be pointing out. By the way, if this is your first time here, yes, the constellations have seasons. 
for example, you'll never see Gemini the Twins during the fall, and likewise you'll never see Cygnus the Swan during the spring. We'll meet Cygnus a little later. As you probably already know, the Earth has four seasons, spring, summer, fall, and winter. Well, the constellations also have seasons, having to do with the Earth's yearly orbital path around the Sun. That, and the fact that we can only see stars by looking away from the Sun at night, which changes our view of the stars throughout the year. Unfortunately, unless you're at a good dark sky sight, most constellations will be somewhat hard to see fully. But most constellations have at least a few bright stars to help identify them, and the better your viewing location, the more you'll be able to see. A good first step to finding the constellations is done by knowing your compass directions. We can easily do this without a compass using a star grouping that is quite easy to find. Cassiopeia, the Queen, also known as the Big W. Face the sky roughly 90 degrees to the right of where the sun had set and look about halfway up from the horizon to the top of the sky and you'll see it. As you can see, Cassiopeia has five stars that make up the W shape, which is actually her throne. From this angle, it's upside down. This sixth star makes up the seat of the throne, which can be seen to have a rather unergonomic back. Off the tip of the more squashed end of the W, you might see another somewhat faint seventh star. Just connect the end of the W to that star and extend the line until it comes to the semi-bright star, which is named Polaris and is otherwise known as the North Star. It's the only star in the entire sky that stays pretty much right where it is. So no matter what time of the night it is, or even what month of the year it is, all you need to do is face it, and you'll always be facing due north, with east directly to your right, west directly to your left, and south directly behind you. All the other stars wheel around this pivot point anti-clockwise, making them appear to rise in the east and set in the west. This is, of course, an illusion caused by the Earth's spin, which gives the appearance that the stars are moving, when in fact, it is the Earth that's moving. If you think of the Earth as a spinning top, and you extend Earth's north pole straight up into the sky, it points almost directly at Polaris. Using Polaris, we found all the compass directions, but Polaris is also the end of the Little Dipper's handle, whose official name is Ursa Minor, the Little Bear, and our next constellation. It's a bit faint, but from Polaris, you might be able to trace its curving handle to its bowl. The two brighter stars at the end of its bowl are called the Guardians, because they seem to march around the North Star like protective sentries throughout the night. Here is Draco the Dragon, with his squarish head, long neck, two short legs and feet, and long tail, which arcs gracefully over the Little Dipper. Just between Draco and Cassiopeia, we find our next constellation, Cepheus, the king. And yes, he is Cassiopeia's husband. At this time of night, he's upside down, but he's got a triangular crown, a squarish head with a pigtail at the base of his head, and he's smiling, cause he's the king. I like finding him by using the non-squashed end of Cassiopeia, which points directly into his face. To find our next constellation, let's first look at the asterism known as the Great Square. By the way, an asterism is not a constellation, but merely a familiar star grouping. The brightest star of the square is the head of Andromeda, the Chained Lady. She's got one star as her head, a torso, and one arm pointing out away from her body with a couple of chains attached. The other foreshortened arm is curled down below, and she has one straight leg, while the other leg is up and bent at the knee. If your sky is dark enough, you might see a dim fuzzy spot just off her knee. Binoculars would make it plain to see in even somewhat light polluted skies. That's the Andromeda Galaxy, our nearest neighboring spiral galaxy at 2.5 million light years from us, which makes it the furthest object that can be seen with the naked eye. It's on a collision course with our own Milky Way galaxy, but worry not. The collision won't happen for another 5 billion years, give or take a few hundred million. To continue, let's turn our view to the south, like so. This will flip everything we've seen to the north upside down and will enable us to find the rest of the night's major constellations more easily. The other three stars of the Great Square make up the wing of our next constellation, 
Pegasus, the winged horse. His wing attaches to the rear end of his body, and he's got four legs, neck, and long horsey nose. To the right of Pegasus is Cygnus the Swan, who I first mentioned near the beginning of this presentation. It's got a pair of large sweeping wings, a long neck, and nose. Its brightest star is called Deneb. To the right of Cygnus we find Lyra the Lyre, a small Greek harp and not a person who tells untruths. Its brightest star is the seventh brightest star in the night sky, Vega. Just below Cygnus and Lyra, we have the constellation Aquila, the eagle. He's a bit faint, but has a head with a beak and its bright eye, Altair. Two swept forward wings, a body, and tail. The three bright stars, Vega, Altair, and Deneb, make up our next asterism, which we call the Summer Triangle. You'll recall I mentioned asterisms before with the Great Square. Though it's called the Summer Triangle, we'll be seeing this familiar star grouping through the remainder of fall before losing it to the daylight of the sun. To the right of Lyra, we find our next constellation, Hercules, the Strongman. That square is the asterism called the Keystone, and from there you might be able to make out the rest of him, a man running along whilst brandishing a large club. Somewhat low above the southern horizon is a kind of invisible line where the zodiacal constellations can be found. This line is called the ecliptic and is also where the sun, moon, and planets move along. This is why the zodiacal constellations were so significant to astrologers. Not that astronomy scientists believe in the pseudoscience of astrology, most don't. But astrologers were some of history's first astronomers, and for their early work, we are in their debt. Our first zodiacal constellation is Sagittarius the Archer, just getting ready to set in the southwest with his triangular head, body, feet, and left hand holding out his bow while his right hand is held aloft as though he just loosed an arrow. A lot of Sagittarius is too faint to be fully seen, especially being so close to the southwest horizon, but he's got yet another asterism that consists of the brighter parts of him and are easy to find called the teapot. So, unless you're at a good dark sky site, look for the teapot and you'll have found a good portion of Sagittarius. Just to the left of Sagittarius are two bright quote-unquote stars, which aren't stars at all, but rather the planet Saturn on the left and Jupiter on the right. If you get a chance, take a look at them through as big a telescope as you can. They are both rather spectacular. Just to the left of Saturn and Jupiter is our next zodiacal constellation, Capricornus, the goat. At first glance, he looks like a child's top or an upside-down pyramid, but as you can see, he's got a horn on his head, a body with legs, and a small tail. Our next constellation is Aquarius, the water bearer. Though, unless you're at a really good dark sky site, I'd skip trying to find him, as he is quite faint. As you can see, he looks like a man holding a vessel of water that's spilling as he runs along. Our last zodiacal constellation, and the last constellation of the night, is Pisces the Fishes. Pisces is pretty faint, and you'd have to have a pretty dark sky to see it. But I had to mention it because it contains a planet we haven't seen since June of 2019. More than a year. Mars. Mars will appear as a fairly bright, somewhat reddish-colored star rising above the eastern horizon, and fortuitously will still be close to opposition, meaning Earth and Mars will be as close together as their orbits allow for this year. This gives our best views of the planet when looking through Earth-bound telescopes, which I again fully recommend. Two other things. First, this month we have a full moon on Halloween, and it's a blue moon. It won't actually be blue, but it will be the second full moon within the same month. An October full moon is called a hunter's moon, so officially this Halloween's full moon should be called a blue hunter's moon, or a hunter's blue moon, or thereabouts. Second, the Orionid meteor shower is happening right now. It peaks on October 20th and 21st, and it will display perhaps as many as 20 meteors per hour, with a few bright fireballs every now and then, seen from a good dark sky. No equipment is needed other than an adjustable lawn recliner and maybe a sleeping bag. Point your feet to the south and just watch as much of the sky as possible. 
The meteors will appear to originate from the constellation Orion the Hunter, but will be visible over the entire sky. The best time to view most meteor showers is around 2 a.m., and by that time, the waxing crescent moon will have already set, so the sky should be nice and dark, perfect for searching out faint meteors. And that's it. There are other smaller or fainter constellations out there, which I encourage you to look for using a good book and maybe a pair of binoculars, too. Speaking of good books, I cannot more highly recommend the book The Stars, A New Way to See Them, by the author H. A. Ray, who you may know as the same author who wrote the Curious George books. Ray was a scientist who wasn't satisfied with the way modern star charts are drawn. The astroscientists were not interested in the characters, objects, or stories behind the constellations, so for convenience, they just connected the brighter stars into weird geometric shapes, slapped on their Greek names, many of which would mean nothing to the common person, and left it at that. That's all fine and well for them, but for us regular folk, we're more interested in the fun stuff. If you really want to learn the constellations, get Ray's book which can be purchased from Amazon.com for about $12. I'd also recommend getting a pair of binoculars before getting a telescope. Binoculars are cheaper and easier to use, and there are many wonderful deep sky objects that can actually be best seen with just a pair of binoculars that are noted in Ray's book. If you do want to get a telescope, ask us or research on the web how to make an informed purchase. Be warned. There are a lot of bad telescopes out there with cheap components and shaky, muddy, fuzzy views that will disappoint you every time. A good scope will inspire you and your children to a lifetime of deep space exploration and an appreciation of science and nature in general. If you're interested in getting into the hobby of astronomy, joining a local astronomy club can be most helpful. Chabot is partnered with the EAS, the East Bay Astronomical Society, which has many activities and resources you'll find essential to help you get started in this amazing and beautiful study of our natural universe. Thanks for watching this video. If you like this content, be sure to click the thumbs up button, subscribe to our channel, and hit the bell notification icon to find out when new content has been uploaded. This will really help our channel to grow, which would make us all very happy. And we'll see you in the future. All right. Well, I hope everybody enjoyed that. Let me see if we can get our video back on here. There we go. All right. So uh, during Don's presentations, one of the things he talked about was the blue moon. And I wanted to elaborate a little bit about that. Uh, there are two types of blue moons. The most common one occurs when there are two full moons in the same calendar month. So we had a full moon on October 1st, and we're going to have another one on October 31st. Uh, the time between full moons is roughly 29 and a half days. So sometimes we get two full moons in the same calendar month. And when that happens, we say that the second full moon in the calendar month is the blue moon. So on October 31st, we'll have our second uh, uh, full moon for October. And so that'll be a blue moon. But there's another kind of blue moon, and it's a little bit rarer. And that occurs when there are four full moons in one season. So seasons run roughly three months. Uh, right now we're in the fall season. Uh, winter starts around uh, the 21st or 22nd of December and, and spring starts around the 21st or 22nd of March and so forth. Occasionally what happens because of that 29 and a half day timing between full moons, you occasionally get a situation where you get four full moons in one three month season. And when that happens, that the third of the four full moons is also called a blue moon. Now we won't have that this time around. In fact, the next time we'll have that is next spring, we will have 
a four full moon season. And so the third of the four will be the uh, blue moon for that season. So anyway, I just wanted to share that with you. Uh, as is Anna, if you're still with us, uh, if you can join us, maybe we can start talking about some of those questions that you had. Uh, there you are. I'm here, I'm here. That was a really informative video. Uh, yeah. yeah, Don does a really good job on those. Yeah. It reminded me of my, my time at uh, Chavo College when I was taking, I took astronomy at Chavo College. So yeah, it reminded me of those days. So that was, that was a really, really cool video. All right, well, thank you. <laughs> and Don thanks you. <laughs> so, yes. Yeah, yeah. Well, so, I, have some, I have some really good questions. So okay. let's get started okay. with the first one. So Okay, just to review, questions. these are questions that were submitted through your article on the Oakland side, right? That's correct. These are all questions from Oakland side readers. So thank you all who submitted your questions. I hope you're watching. Um, in fact, one of them, which we'll get towards the end of the questions, um, she the video sort of answer a portion of it, but in case she's, you know, yeah, she didn't get yeah. to watch the initial video, then you'll have an answer for her. So we'll start with Ben who wants to know, he has like a two in one question. Um, he says, do you know anything about the asteroid coming on election day and can Shibo see asteroids with a telescope? Okay. Well, I'll answer the second part of the question first. Uh, Shibo can see asteroids with our telescope. We have one very large telescope here. It's 36 inches in diameter. It's uh, uh, a reflecting telescope that uses mirrors instead of lenses. And that telescope is actually registered with uh, the International Astronomical Union. And it's part of a global effort to search for and track near Earth asteroids. So we actually use that, that telescope to track near Earth asteroids. Uh, and the one that uh, is supposedly coming around uh, somewhere around election day, that is a near Earth asteroid. Now, right now that asteroid, which was discovered in 2018, is predicted to not come really close to the Earth. Uh, the predicted orbit has it passing the Earth actually slightly farther away than the moon. So the moon is 240,000 miles away. This is gonna be about 250,000 miles away. Um, however, uh, this asteroid was discovered in 2018, and it was only observed for about a two-week period. So there was not very much data uh, to use to uh, calculate its orbit. And as a result, there's a lot of uncertainty about the orbit. So we're not even sure that it will actually come by on the day before Election Day. It may come by on Election Day. It may come by on the Sunday before Election Day. We're still not 100% sure. We're also not 100% sure about how close it will come to the Earth. Uh, like I said, the predicted orbit says it will be about 250,000 miles away from us, which is a little bit farther than the moon. But when they take all the data that they collect for these events or for these asteroids and they calculate the orbits, they have to take into consideration the, the small um, variations in the observations. And so they have to calculate alternate orbits, what we call virtual orbits uh, that describe different possible paths and different uh, distances for the closest approach. One of those, and it's a very small percentage, but one of those actually has this object impacting the earth. But the, again, the odds of that happen are extremely small. And even if it does happen, it won't be a problem for the, those of us here on Earth because this asteroid is very small. It's only about the size of a mid-sized car. So when it, if it hits the Earth, it will burn up in our atmosphere. If you happen to be in the right place, which would be somewhere in the Southern Hemisphere, most likely, uh, you might see it as a very bright, what we call bolide or shooting star with that's uh, brighter than the typical shooting star. Mm -hmm. But it won't hit the ground. It won't produce a crater. It's not going to blow out windows or injure anybody or anything like that. So it's, it's not a hazard at all to, to people here on Earth. It's just something very interesting. And the timing is kind of interesting because it's close to or even possibly on election day. Right. All right. 
So people who are scared, of course, because of everything else that has happened this year, yeah, yeah, this, just sure this, that we will be okay. Yes, yeah, this one you don't have to be afraid about. <laughs> so, all right, good. Uh, um, all right, so I have a question from Ellen, um, and she wants to know why does the moon have so many craters? Well, um, you know, if this asteroid we were just talking about were to hit the moon, it would produce a crater. And remember I said it may come about the same distance as the moon. So if the moon were in the right place, uh, that asteroid would hit the moon. And it turns out that happens quite often. And it's been happening for nearly 4 billion years. And since the moon does not have uh, an atmosphere, doesn't have oceans or lakes, doesn't have vegetation, it doesn't have plate tectonics, it doesn't have any of that. It's just cold and dry. And because of that, uh, if you make a mark in the, in the ground, it stays there for millions of years. Uh, I'm sure you've seen photographs of the footprints left on the moon by the astronauts. That was over 50 years ago. Those footprints are still there and they will be there a million years from now. Wow. Uh, so, so when you look at the moon with a telescope or even with a pair of binoculars, you see all these craters. And if you could uh, get a more powerful telescope and zoom in even more, you would see that it's just craters on top of craters and top of craters. Uh, the moon has been hit millions and millions, in fact, billions of times by asteroids and occasional comets and they produce the craters that we see. And because there is no weather, there's nothing to redo the surface of the moon. Mm -hmm. Those craters just stay there uh, for millions and millions of years. And that's why we see so many craters on the moon. Now the earth gets hit quite often too, mm -hmm. but there's several differences with the earth. Uh, we have an atmosphere, so small asteroids burn up in our atmosphere. We have, because we have an atmosphere, we have weather. We have rain and we have, uh, you know, tornadoes and so on. We have oceans and lakes, we have vegetation, and we've got uh, those little two-legged creatures that wander around. And all of that constantly re -cha or changes the surface along with plate tectonics and volcanism and so on that's constantly resurfacing the earth. So old craters kind of get rubbed away and uh, so we, we don't see very many craters on the earth, but the earth has actually been hit 16 times more often than the moon by asteroids and comets. It's just wow. most of the craters are gone. There are about 180 craters on the earth that we can see that we actually are, are at the surface. One of the most famous ones is near Flagstaff, Arizona. Um, but most of those craters, they just get worn away by the, the weather and plate tectonics and so forth. Do you know what's the most uh, recent one? I know you mentioned the most famous one, but is there... Uh, the most recent crater that I know of is in Carancas, Peru. Uh, it's near Lake Titicaca. And that was an impact that occurred in 2007, a very small one. In fact, this was the exception that makes the rule. Uh, this asteroid was not very big. It was only about two or three meters across, which is actually smaller than the one that we're talking about on election day. Uh, that asteroid uh, somehow managed to get all the way down to the ground and it produced a crater that was about 40 or 45 feet wide uh, in a, in, actually on a road next to a pasture in a small village uh, in the floodplain of Lake Titicaca. And that's that's the last one I that I know of that actually produced a crater. Yeah, that's so interesting. Wow. Yeah, yeah. All right, we're gonna move on to okay. the question from Rhonda Baker, and Rhonda wants to know, what is the most asked question from elementary school age children while in the planetarium, and what is the answer? Gee, um, <laughs> actually, I can think of two questions that get asked a lot. Uh, amazingly, you know, elementary school age children today, they weren't, a, well, they weren't alive in the year 2006. But in 2006, the International Astronomical Union demoted Pluto from a planet to a dwarf planet. And we still get asked today frequently from elementary school kids, 
why did that happen? What was the reason that uh, Pluto got demoted? The other question we get asked about all the time is black holes. Uh, we get lots of questions about black holes, different kinds of questions, you know, will you be crushed by a black hole? You know, can you, can you survive falling into a black hole and so forth? Uh, but those are the two most common questions. Uh, I don't wanna get into a long answer about Pluto. Pluto is very small. Uh, when it was first discovered, we actually thought it was bigger than the Earth. Uh, but over time, as our ability to observe got better, and as we did more calculations, we realized it's actually very small. Uh, and it's in an odd orbit. It's out it kind of at the fringe of the solar system. Out Most of the time, it's beyond Neptune, uh, although its orbit is highly, what we say, elliptical. So rather than it being a circle, it's an ellipse, like an oval. Mm -hmm. And it is sometimes closer to the sun than Neptune and sometimes farther than Neptune. Uh, its orbit is also tilted quite a bit relative to the orbits of the other planets. While the other planets in the solar system orbit roughly parallel to each other uh, along a path we call the ecliptic. But uh, Pluto's orbit is tilted quite a bit relative to the ecliptic. So it's small size, the fact that its orbit is very different than the other planets of the solar system. And in night, starting in 1992, we began to discover other icy bodies in the same region of the solar system. And eventually uh, astronomers got together and said, well, either we're gonna call all those other things planets or we're gonna create a new category and Pluto will be part of that new category. So we now consider Pluto to be a dwarf planet, not a regular sized planet. So it's, you know, in my mind, it's still a planet. It's just yeah. a dwarf planet, right? You know? Yeah. So when, when people ask me how many planets are there in the solar system, I don't say eight or nine, I say a million. Because yeah. You got, you got terrestrial planets like the Earth and Mars and so on. You've got giant planets like Jupiter and Saturn. And then you have the dwarf planets like Pluto and, and Ceres. And then you have all the minor planets, asteroids and comets. Those are called minor planets. So when you add them all up, it's well over a million. Is there a list of dwarf planets? Yes, there is. Oh. Uh, I think we're up to six now, uh, dwarf planets. Uh, don't ask me. Uh, you know, it's Pluto, it's Ceres. Uh, there's one called um, Maki Maki, I think is one of them. And then there's one called Hyamea. Um, I, I don't remember all of them right now off the top of my head. But yeah, I think we're up to six official dwarf planets. This is really interesting. And of course, I want to yeah. point out for, you know, kids, of course, you know, kids and parents who, unfortunately, they can't visit uh, the, the center. You guys have an outstanding online uh, videos and, and all the, you know, all these live events that you guys produce. So, you know, children can still yeah. ask those questions. And one of the things, you know, we can't, we can't have people up at the observatories right now, but that means, yeah. doesn't mean you can't see through the, the telescopes. On Saturday nights, we do a virtual telescope program starting at nine o'clock or nine o'clock on Chabot's Facebook page. And we actually put a camera on our telescope and we point it at different objects at the planets, at, uh, at galaxies and star clusters and nebulae and so on, and let you see what they look like through the telescope. So you, you can't come up here, but you can still look through the telescopes. That's definitely a great activity for a Saturday yeah. night. Yeah. So yeah, I, I hope others others join. All right, let's see what's the next question. We have a question from Beryl, and Beryl says or wants to know. I learned recently that some animals are triggered by starlight to do their life ta life task. Is this a thing that humans are in tune with as well? Is this something that all creatures are somewhat affected by? Uh, does there tend to be more activity on the ground during the more starry nights? Gee, that's a long, that's a long, that's yeah, a yeah, that's, that's, that's so, uh, quite a loaded one there. Yeah. <laughs> so, so let me take part of it anyway. Yes, human beings are also attuned to the night. Uh, you, we have what's called a circadian ry rhythm, and it's actually triggered and kind of reset according to our perception of day and night. 
so, you know, one of the things that uh, we're, we're preaching to, especially youngsters nowadays, and we should do the same thing with adults too, is don't look at screens at nighttime within an hour of time to go to bed. And that's because the light from that screen is triggering your circadian rhythm that, that it's still daylight and that it's, you should be still awake. And you don't want to do that. You want your, your body and, and your circadian rhythm to think that it's now nighttime, it's getting dark, and it's time to go to sleep. So your body is definitely triggered by night versus daytime. Uh, and and, and what, what Beryl said about other animals, that is true across the animal kingdom, that they are definitely attuned to whether it's day or night, and there are different you know, activities that they do at nighttime and the daytime. There are animals who only come out at night. Uh, so, so yes, it's across, across the whole animal spectrum, including us humans. Uh, let's see, is there more activity during the, the starry nights? I, I don't know about yeah. that. I know it's just a matter of whether it's light or dark. Uh, and I, I think moonlight sometimes affects how some animals behave as well. Um, so yeah, I, I, that's about all I know about that. So, <laughs> so you stumped the star, you know, so. Um, and I think just looking at the comments, I think Beryl is, uh, it's here with us tonight. So thank oh, you. For good. Good. And, you know, I hope that this was, this was the answer that you were looking yeah, for. Yeah. Well, at least part of it anyway. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> so. Um, all right. So we have one more and this is from Sasha and, Part of her question is, uh, it was answered during the video earlier, but in case she wasn't tuned in when the video was playing, um, I'll ask and then you can, you know, let us know. So she says, how does the star's appearance in the sky seem to change throughout the year? Oh. Why are there more constellations we can see year round and some we can't? Why does the Big Dipper's orientation in the sky depend on the season? Okay. That's a, that's a big and actually a lot of that was answered in the video, but just to kind of review um, the earth rotates around its axis. In fact, I've got a model of the earth right here. So the earth is floating around out in space and it's rotating around its axis and that's what gives us the day and night. So the sun is shining on one side of it. That's the daytime side and on the other side is the night side. As the earth orbits around the sun. Uh, where the sun is relative to the background stars changes as the, as the Earth orbits all the way around. And because of that, we see different uh, constellations at night uh, at different times of the year. Uh, and you may have noticed in the video, there was uh, a, a, an animation that Don showed you where as the Earth orbited around the sun, you know, the night side of the earth points to different parts of the sky. And so you see different uh, constellations. So that's why we see different constellations throughout the year and in different seasons. Now, the other question he asked is what about things like the Big Dipper and certain constellations that always seem to be up there? And that's a really good question. Um, the earth as it's orbiting around the sun does not turn around its axis perpendicular to its orbit around the sun. It's actually tilted relative to the orbit around the sun. And as the earth is rotating, uh, we, uh, we see uh, um, the North Star, which is directly off the North Pole, and we see constellations that are around the North Star. As the earth rotates around its axis, those constellations appear to rotate around the North Star. And if you are far enough north to see the Big Dipper, uh, you will see it year round. It'll be in different positions uh, over the course of the night and it will be uh, in different positions during the course of the year. So when it's high in the sky in, in the summertime, it's low in the sky in the wintertime and so forth. And that's because um, the rotation of the Earth, the rotation axis of the axis of the Earth points at the North Star, and any stars and any constellations that are close to the North Star that you can see from your location, uh, we can see year-round. We call those stars circumpolar stars, and the farther you are north, the more constellations you see that are circumpolar. 
And when you're, say, on the equator, you can just barely make out the North Star, and there are no circumpolar stars. But as you get farther and farther north, we're about 38 degrees north of the equator here. So any constellation and any star that's within 38 degrees of the North Star, we see all night long and all year long. All right. I have a question, and this is for myself. This is my question. If it's all right. It's okay that I asked one as well. Um, on the 31st, we're going to have this hunter uh, blue moon, right? On, right? on Halloween, I'm sorry, Halloween night. Um, is there anything, you know, I know people's plans are probably going to be changing typically to what they would have done um, on Halloween. So maybe, you know, watching the sky and this beautiful moon, it's a better, a better, a safe plan for families to do. Is there something that we should be looking out for in the sky? Well, it'll be a full moon, so the moon will be up all night long, and because it's a full moon, it will light up the ground quite a bit, so you should be able to see things around you fairly well. Um, you won't see a lot of detail. For example, if you tried to look at the moon that night with a telescope or a pair of binoculars, you'd be kind of disappointed because you wouldn't see a lot of uh, detail. The reason for that is during a full moon, the part of the moon that we see is fully lit as if the sun were straight overhead. If you were standing on the moon that night, uh, the sun would appear to be straight overhead. And because of that, it casts no shadows. So, you know, there's all these craters on the moon and, and mountains and so forth. And normally they cast shadows, but during a full moon, the part of the moon that we see is directly lit by the sun and so we see no shadows mm -hmm. and because of that you get no sense at all of the texture of the moon the depth of the craters and the heights of the mountains and so forth uh, so astronomers hate looking at the moon during a full moon because you know it's just not as entertaining as it is say in first quarter or last quarter or something like that when there are shadows on the moon so but, you know, one of the cool things, of course, is the fact that that really bright full moon makes it really easy to see things all around you. You can walk around at night and, and have pretty good visibility. Okay. So if you want to, like, venture out into, you know. Yeah. Ordinarily, I would say full moon. Great night to be out trick-or-treating. Yeah, I know. Unfortunately, this is not a good year to be doing that. Definitely. But, you know, maybe families can be in the backyards. And if you're saying uh, they can be, you know, they'll be able to see what's around them. Maybe right. right. Yards, exactly. That's a great place right. to exactly. kind of yeah. see, see what they see. And that means the hobgoblins couldn't jump out at you so easily. You know? so. <laughs> well, I know that there's uh, questions from uh, the people watching who are, are tuning yeah, in. We, uh, yeah, I've got a couple here. And then I think Jessica, our producer, she's over here a safe distance away from me here. And I think she's picking up a few more from Facebook. But uh, one of the kind of the last minute set of questions we got, and there were several of them from Janet Maher, who is uh, actually a Chabot volunteer, and she's also on our foundation board. So uh, I just wanted to kind of go through those if, if we've got a few minutes here. Um, her, her first question was, uh, a year on Mercury is longer than a day, right? And that's actually wrong. Now on Earth, a year is much longer than a day, but Mercury is kind of odd. It rotates like the Earth does, but it rotates so slowly that it takes two orbits of Mercury around the sun. In other words, two Mercury years for one Mercury day. So, oh, wow. So... If you're on Mercury, you make one complete trip around uh, the sun and you've gone from one noontime to one midnight. And then you have to make another trip around the sun to go from that midnight back to noontime. So uh, a day on, on Mercury is about 176 Earth days long, whereas the orbit of Mercury is about 88 Earth days long. So that's pretty cool that that, that is really so. interesting yeah. yeah all right um her second question was is it true that all planets rotate counterclockwise uh counterclockwise as viewed from the north so if you were above uh the earth 
looking down at the North Pole of the Earth, it would appear to be rotating counterclockwise. Um, and if you were above uh, north of the solar system and looking down on the planets, it would appear that most of them turn counterclockwise, but not all of them. Um, in fact, Venus has a very odd orbit. We think Venus actually was impacted by a large object very early in the solar system's history, as was the Earth. But in Venus's case, it actually hit it so hard that it stopped the rotation of the planet and caused it to actually rotate backward very slowly. Uh, so it takes Venus uh, about a hundred and, or I'm sorry, about 243 days to rotate backward one complete rotation. So it's, uh, they, Venus actually rotates backwards. Now there's another planet that's kind of odd and that's the planet Uranus, uh, which is the correct pronunciation, not that other one that all the kids like to use. Uh, <laughs> the planet is called Uranus. It's named after the father of the Titans in Greek mythology. And Uranus has a very odd orbit or odd uh, rotation because its rotation axis is not perpendicular to the rotation or its orbital axis. So the Earth, remember I said the Earth is tipped a little bit relative to its orbit. Mm -hmm. Uranus is turned all the way over on its side. Oh, wow. So as it orbits around the sun, sometimes the poles face the sun, Sometimes the equator faces the sun, then the other pole, and then the other side of the equator. And that changes every quarter of a year for Uranus. And uh, we think that was also the result of an impact with a large object early in the history of the solar system. Mm -hmm. All right. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. Um, so let's see. The last one that she submitted is, which is the closest planet to the Earth? And then she sort of added it in parentheses most of the time, because there's actually a couple of different answers to this. Um, ordinarily, uh, we would say the closest planet to the Earth is Venus, because Venus is the second planet from the sun. Earth is the third planet from the sun. Our orbits, Venus's orbit is the closest to the Earth's orbit. However, Venus is almost always too far away from us to be considered the closest planet. Um, that right now, the closest planet to the Earth is Mars. Mars uh, reaches a point every uh, two and a half, two years and two months or so, when it's directly opposite the Earth from the Sun, what we call opposition. And that's usually within a few days of when it's closest to the Earth. So right now, Mars is about 40 million miles away from the Earth. But the planet that's actually most often closest to the Earth is the planet Mercury. Mercury orbits around the sun very rapidly. It takes only 88 days to make one orbit. And because of that, Mercury is frequently on our side of the sun, whereas Venus is on our side of the sun much less often. So as it works out, the planet that is most often closest to the Earth is Mercury, which is the planet closest to the sun. All right. OK, so those are the, the questions that Janet submitted. Uh, I've, you, got, Janet. I've got uh, uh, Jessica uh, Williams is over here. She's our producer and she's over here watching Facebook. And I guess we're getting questions on Facebook. So. Uh, Hi, Gerald. Yes, we have a few All right. questions. There, there, there she is. Yeah. Okay. Um, so the first question is from Erica. And the question is, can you recommend some binoculars for sky viewing? Okay. Uh, I like the fact that she's asking about binoculars because people often want to go right straight to the fanciest telescope they can afford. And we don't recommend that. Uh, your first telescope ought to be a pair of binoculars. And what we recommend is a pair of binoculars that are comfortable for you to hold, so they're not real big and heavy. Um, the front lenses should be somewhere between 42 and 50 millimeters in diameter. And the magnification should be somewhere between seven and 10 times. Now, the way you can tell 
whether the, the binoculars meet these criteria is there's a number that you'll see on the binoculars and it'll be something like 7x50 or 8x42, something like that. The first number, the eight or the seven, or sometimes it's a 10, that's the magnification. So you want that number to be somewhere between seven and 10 for a, a nice comfortable pair of binoculars. The second number is a bigger number and that's the diameter of the front lenses on the binoculars. And you'd like those to be somewhere in the 40 to 50 millimeter uh, range. Uh, I have seen a lot of uh, binoculars that are seven by 50 or 10 by 50. Those would be good binoculars. Uh, the pair of binoculars that I use most often is a eight by 42. I like them because uh, you know, they, they're very lightweight to, to hold, so they're easy to hold and um, they're very comfortable. Uh, but any, anything in that range, and there's several different brands. There's Bushnell, there's uh, Celestron, there's a bunch of different companies that make binoculars. And what you want to do is just find a pair that, that fall within that range of magnification and front aperture opening, um, and then see what, what's comfortable for you. And have at it. And, and if you get a pair of binoculars like that, plus a good book, uh, like the one that Don recommended in his video, or any good astronomy book that shows the constellations and tells you a little bit about some of the deep sky objects that are out there. Um, binoculars is a great way to get started. All right, next question. All right, the next question is from Angela, who asks, do you have any tips on how an amateur can calibrate their telescope? Uh, let's see. I'm not sure what you mean by calibrate. There is a process called collimation, uh, which may be what you're talking about. If you have a reflecting telescope, a reflecting telescope has two mirrors. It has a big mirror at the base of the telescope and then a small mirror at the front of the telescope. And in order for it to work at its optimum, the two mirrors have to be aligned with each other. And that process is called collimation. And there are different techniques. You can, there's some devices you can buy to help you do it. Uh, but a lot of amateur astronomers, it's a very simple technique that they use. And that is to point the telescope at a re moderately bright star and defocus the telescope. So you put an eyepiece on the telescope, you look through the eyepiece at a star and you, you adjust the telescope to the star is out of focus. And when you do that, you'll see that the star image becomes like a donut, a, a bright white donut. And if the donut hole is precisely centered in the middle of the donut, then your telescope is calibrated properly. Uh, if it's not, then you have to adjust the telescope to get it in the correct position. And most of the time that's done by a set of adjusting screws that are on the back end of the telescope behind the primary mirror and you just tweak those until you get that donut hole so it's right in the center of the donut of a star that's out of focus. So I, I hope I'm answering the question right because uh, that's the, the, the technique of calibration that I'm most familiar with. If she has something else in mind, maybe she could uh, uh, do another question and elaborate a little bit more. All right. Another question from Beryl. Does our orbit change our naked eye's understanding of what's further or closer away from, depending on the time of year? And do some constellations share stars depending on our orbit? Um, some constellations do share stars, but they are, it's not based on the orbit. It's based on the International Astronomical Union's uh, designation of what constellations are where. So for a long time, constellations, uh, different cultures had different constellations. You know, the, uh, to give you a good example, there's a constellation called uh, Corona Borealis, which is the Northern Crown. Uh, that's the official designation now. But Native Americans used to call that constellation the Campfire Circle because it looks like a little circle of stars up in the sky. 
Um, so different cultures had different names for the constellations and even different patterns for the constellations. So they didn't all use the same stars to make up the constellation. Well, as astronomy became an international effort, that difference in culture for the constellations became a problem. So in the 1920s, the International Astronomical Union uh, got together and they uh, basically made a decision that these are gonna be the constellations. There are now 88 constellations. These are the boundaries of the constellations. So they basically divided up the sky in what we now consider the official constellations. And um, so regardless of the time of the year, those constellations are all the same and the boundaries are all the same. Uh, but there are a couple of constellations that are often considered to share stars with each other. One uh, example, which is up right now, uh, the constellation Pegasus is easily identifiable by what we call the Great Square of Pegasus. It's four reasonably bright stars that form a square pattern in the sky. And for those of us in the Bay Area, it's actually quite high at this time of the year. Um, technically, one of the four stars is not part of Pegasus. It's actually part of the constellation Andromeda. But when you see Pegasus depicted in books, it's often depicted as having all four stars in it. But the, what is it, the northeasternmost star uh, is actually part of the constellation Andromeda. So it's kind of a shared star, all right? And it, it doesn't matter what time of the year, if you can see the constellation, all the stars are gonna be the same in the constellation and the constellation boundaries are gonna remain the same throughout the year. Now, over long periods of time, millions of years, the constellations are gonna change. The stars in the sky, we call them fixed stars, but they're actually not fixed. They are moving around uh, very, very slowly. Uh, so over the course of thousands or even millions of years, the stars do gradually change position relative to each other and so, you know, the constellation Pegasus, the way it looks now is not the way it's going to look a million years from now. So there is over very long periods of time, there are changes to how the constellations appear. All right. And that's all the questions we have. All right. Well, gee, it's almost 10 o'clock, or I'm sorry, nine o'clock. It's 10 o'clock somewhere, but it's almost nine o'clock here. Uh, I'm glad everybody had a chance to submit some questions. And as Zena, thank you very much for the article. We really enjoyed it. And thank you for inviting your, your readers to submit questions. I hope we can do it again sometime. Yeah, thank you so much, Harold, and the entire Chabot Space and Science Center uh, team for letting us do this uh, this month. We're, we're really excited. Thank you to all the readers who submitted questions. and. You know, I was really pleased to, really excited to do the the story about what you guys are doing, you know, online with all the programming. And I look forward to doing more once you guys are open. That will be really exciting. And, and we all look forward to that next summer. All right, great. Well, um, we're about to sign off here. I want to invite everybody, if you uh, want to actually see some stars and see some galaxies and some planets and things through the telescope, Join us tomorrow night at uh, nine o'clock. Uh, we'll have our virtual telescope program. It'll be myself and Richard Ozer and John Curry. And we'll get on and we'll uh, show you the sights we can see with our telescope. So until then, thanks again and have a good evening. Good night. Thank you all. Good night.